Okay, so this video is just focused on considering error and absorption, absorption measurements and how we might, from an analytical perspective, um, have a little bit more additional consideration how to set up our spectrometer uh, to minimize error in our measurements, which may be different than uh, the reason why you measure absorbance in other sort of sub-disciplines or um, other labs or other classes. For instance, um, in an inorganic class, you may simply be measuring the absorbance to understand the electronic transitions in the visible and the UV spectrum, but you have no care about using it for extracting quantitative information. From an analytical perspective, of course, we're, we're typically asking uh, numerical or quantitative questions. So a couple things to consider, and I'm just using, um, just for uh, an example, the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A, um, because as I'm recording this video, the trees and the leaves are changing um, outside, so I thought it was pretty relevant. Uh, as an aside, you can see why plants are green uh, because of the absorbance uh, spectrum of chlorophyll A, where it absorbs strongly in the red, uh, which uh, and green is is down here. This is why we have the the the, the color that we do. Um, so, a couple considerations when thinking about using a spectrum like this for extracting quantitative information. One is um, this may sound really really um, intuitive to you, but I but I need to state it. Um, if you are say using um, Beer's law, which is what you would use if you're if you're um, utilizing a spectrum like this, a general spectrum like this, um, to extract uh, concentration information. Uh, the first thing you want to do is um, where do you want to measure absorbance at? Because absorbance is at a given wavelength. Um, you're going to want to measure where you think you can get a reproducible measurement um, in one where it's most sensitive. And the place where it's most sensitive is going to be where lambda max is. And in this case, there's sort of two prominent lambda maxes. This would be technically lambda max, uh, and we could write that as lambda max 1, and this would be lambda max 2. And you could quantitate it off of either of those because they're going to give you the most signal, most bang for your buck. And um, which means that you can measure lower concentrations and still extract a signal. So that's the first point. Second point is the other reason why you want to measure uh, around um, lambda max and typically even more broader lambda maxes. So in this case, lambda max two is a little bit more broad than lambda max one. Because if you think about at the crest of where that slope change occurs, there's sort of a region there where you can change by a few uh, nanometers uh, in wavelength and you are essentially measuring the same signal because it, it sort of plateaus out and that's better than measuring say like right here on a shoulder where the slope is high and if you if the instrument you know shifts slightly or if you change slightly um, then that can mean significant differences between measurements because you're trying to quantitate over a, a region that's changing rapidly and so those are the two maybe obvious but I need to state them um, uh, things about quantitating off of an absorbent spectrum like this so in terms of precision or reproducibility of measurements, so you've got a, a sample and you put it in a cuvette and you measure it 100 times, how do you get the most uh, reproducible or most precise measurement? One is that you want to measure your absorbance in a range that's typically between 0.3 and 2, and that comes from the sort of hardware limitations that I mentioned before. And specifically on the low end of absorbance, it's difficult for you to differentiate I versus I0 because they're about the same. So differentiating between a very small signal difference. Uh, and then on the high end, we're actually transmitting very, very little. Uh, beyond two, uh, an absorbance of two, you're, you're permitting less than 1% of the light to hit the detector. And so this range becomes a, the most reproducible range that we can measure over. Some other points to consider, um, don't remove the cuvette. Uh, if you can, uh, that might mean like you actually fill the cuvette while it's in place, um, which poses its own issues and safety concerns. But by removing the cuvette, you present lots of opportunity for error by maybe configuring it diff in a different orientation, which changes maybe the thickness of the glass or the parallelism between the two sides of the glass or the, of the cuvette. Um, you want to try to dry the cuvette if you can, which uh, these two things are sort of counter to each other. Uh, they can be. Drying the cuvette, uh, in, this, is, in, this is in the case that um, specifically you're, you know, um, you need to remove the solution from the cuvette. Sometimes you don't. Um, but if you do and you empty it out, the reason why you want to dry it or minimize it is to, um, because if even if there's little bit of drops that are left over inside uh, of water, even if you've rinsed it three times, when you add that next sample in, 
uh, that's going to dilute because there's going to be some water already present, and so that's going to change the concentration to a smaller concentration. Um, the another sort of tactic here, and this is this is actually relevant to virtually all analytical measurements, is if you can, um, if you can't dry it, maybe you keep it in place. One thing to do would be to add uh, your sample to the cuvette undried first uh, and let it touch all the surfaces, pipette it back out, uh, and then pipette it in again. And what that does is it dilutes it the first time, then you remove it, uh, and that dilution might be by 0.001%, but might be, tr might be important on that first measurement, but the second time around that dilution becomes inconsequential. And so pre-rinsing your, uh, your equipment with the sample is ideal when you can do it. This is the same, I would give you the same advice for like a burette. The proper way to, fear, to, to fill a burette for a volumetric measurement would be, because normally burettes are filled with water uh, in storage so they don't dry out, instead of just filling it with your titrant immediately after you drain the water and diluting that, uh, you, you would do a first pre-rinse and then fill it up. Same is always gonna be true, always pre-rinse, pre-wet. Uh, if you go out in the field and you sample with a, a bottle, which we do often in my lab uh, for our Fountain Valley Water Project, um, you don't know what's in that bottle to begin with. Even if it's dry and clean, we don't know. Maybe there's a dried soap residue. Maybe there's, we don't know the history. So when we go and say sample in somebody's home, the first thing we do is fill it up maybe a third of the way, cap it, shake it up really well, pour it out, and then fill it up again with the actual sample. So this is sort of a, a, a ubiquitous or a universal rule or um, piece of advice in, in, um, in any chemical system. And, and it holds true here for cuvettes and absorption measurements too. Of course, uh, fingerprints, wear gloves um, if you need to touch things. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that you know in a dual beam measure, a dual beam experiment, you as I showed you in the previous video, you've got two cuvettes. One is always going to be the blank that just remains in the system, and then one is going to be the sample that gets exchanged. Uh, when you buy these things, um, they come in matched sets. They're really expensive because they're pre precision machined to match each other, and that's because you're measuring I not and I simultaneously, you want to make sure that these things are, are the path lengths are identical. Otherwise, uh, there's going to be a systematic error associated with these. Most of these other things uh, could manifest as either systematic or random. Uh, this would definitely be a systematic type error. And so keeping cells matched is important. You'll see that if you go use any of the U research grade UV vis systems in our department, especially the one in the instrument room uh, outside of the analytical lab, there's a drawer underneath of it and inside that drawer are probably 20 or 30 matched sets of, of cuvettes. Some are glass and some are quartz, uh, and we try to keep them together for, for this reason. Uh, and again, all of these points here are to maximize precision or reproducibility in our, our measurement.